So today uh, we have um, uh, under this for this session three speakers, um, Professor Kea Matos from HKST, and then also we have a speaker from South Korea, Professor Huang uh, from Seoul National University, and then also we have a speaker from Singapore, the Professor Sabrina Luke from Nanyang Technological University. So um, thank you very much for joining us. And first, I'd like to ask Professor Kiamatos to um, give her talk. So the floor is yours. Okay. On my screen share. So a, a few things as I get started. Uh, per, I'm waiting for my slides. Uh, Professor Yumi, my wonderful colleague and next door neighbor in the office, said, Kira, could you could you please be on a panel on this. I'm like, okay, great. He's like, I need you to write, do 10 minutes of opening remarks. And I was like, that is built simultaneously too much and not enough um, for this topic, right? Because it, it's a it's a massive topic. And I will also give a full disclosure. I do a bit of work around kind of data-driven uh, policies in AI, but I am often largely coming at it from a sustainability context because sustainability and innovation is kind of my my core area, but that is increasingly uh, over intersected with issues around AI governance and, and data governance um, for one thing. And the second thing is I'm a bit of a comparativist. So I'm bringing to, to this a lot of work on a lot of different sectors, thinking about what that implies uh, for facilitating. This was just working. I may have to stand up and do this over at the, yeah. Okay, should I just, I'll have you do it? Okay. So one thing I like to think about when I'm thinking about this kind of intersection of innovation and policy generally is that the government has actually several roles in the system. One is that they have the role of setting policy to support innovation, right? A lot of work on investment and systems and in basic research, subsidies for uptake, all these kinds of classic uh, innovation policy tools and approaches, but also innovations then open up space for policy innovation that, that there's a whole world of innovations that help us do policy differently so right so smart cities is a great example of this intersection where the technologies behind the smart city allow government and policymakers to imagine policy tools and policy solutions and implementations that would not have been accessible before that technology and so sometimes it's helpful to separate these two activities a little bit even though there is very much becomes especially I would say in this space an overlap between the two. So obviously, you know, we have these arguments about why governments intervene in, inter in innovation, right? Um, that the markets are often necessary but not sufficient for these transitions and for these developments. Um, a lot of barriers to widespread use and uptake, etc. So what does that mean for data-driven innovation? So there's lots of opportunities, right? And so the opportunities involve the huge number of sectors where we can apply this uh, the potential often touted, I would say, perhaps over touted in the VC community around productivity, efficiency, quality, sustainability gains. Um, but also in this space, the fact that governments have long been modal actors. They are actors that collect and disseminate and use information, right? The census is kind of the original big data. We've been doing that for a couple of thousand years. So governments are kind of uniquely placed in this particular area to be both users and developers. Of course, the challenges, of course, are that this broad range of what data-driven innovation could be make it very hard to decide what the policy should be, right? How do you facilitate an innovation platform, right? Because the goal is not data in and of itself. The goal is data systems that allow us to do other really important things. So, what are the gaps that policymakers need to be addressing here, right? They have to, is it about collection? Is it about availability? We've heard about these platforms for data, right, that are extremely important. Is it about the products? Is it particular end uses or social goals that we're trying to get to here? But a lot of the smart city discussion is, well, the, 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 the consultants would say smart cities for the sake of smart cities, but we would say smart cities for the sake of sustainability and collective action and engagement and, you know, fewer traffic jams and all these sorts of things. Uh, is it about technological capacity and dealing with barriers to uptake and adoption of potentially productivity and quality enhancing uh, technologies, which I'll get to in a second. And so how do you approach this by need, by sector, by technology? And also, of course, in this space, the government is not just a kind of, you know, putting money into the system or trying to put its resources into the system to get something to happen. 
it is both a regulator of these technologies and potentially a very large and important user or market for these technologies. So the roles are, are extremely kind of overlapping here. So of course, you also have many government entities themselves who have data. And by the way, that data isn't usually yet on a pretty platform. Like if you talk to our colleague, Alfred Howard City, he came and talked to my students a couple of years ago and he was saying, you know, when he went to do his research, he discovered, you know, local city authorities have lots of data. It's just, it's in a pile of cardboard boxes in a basement somewhere. Right, and they have neither the time nor the money to put it onto a server and into a platform. Right, it's 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 literally, you know, old school analog. And so you have a lot of these issues that governments have data and they need data, but it's not necessarily where and how it needs to be. So one of my former students, who's now graduated and moved on to bigger and better things, Dr. Vishnu uh, Suvarudran Pillay, did a lot of work. We did a lot of work together on AI in the construction industry in India, which is, I think, a country we don't have a huge amount of discussion of. In this, in this topic, but it's worth thinking about. Um, you have a space with a rapidly changing technology. Construction is not known for its new technology uptake, but especially due to COVID, there's actually been a much rapper, uh, more rapid uh, kind of uptake of various off-the-shelf data-based, uh, data-intensive technologies, including some AI, in an industry that is notoriously low productivity. Okay, uh, most of this is what we call back end. So despite, you know, you can go to the trade shows and they'll show you the autonomous bricklaying machine. But the reality is that most of what's happening in the sector is things like BIM, digital twins, things around design, contracting, site management, inventory management, uh, that kind of technology. Uh, much, much slower is on site development of things like autonomous construction. And is several reasons and it it i think it's important to think about construction because it's not maybe one of the industries we talk about a lot in hong kong we do in hong kong we talk a lot about ai for construction but it's highly bespoke so you have a big data problem okay because no two especially when we start talking about the big the expensive construction projects the infrastructure projects that would benefit the most from this technology everyone is completely different from every other one right so even the question of how do you gather data how are you going to get people to collect the data? How do you get the training data for technologies in this? Is potentially very problematic. But of course, once again, if we think about government, many, many, many of these projects are in fact government projects, right? So if you want that data, if you can think about how to get it, you probably need the government in on this. Thinking about their role in these projects is not just we're building a new subway system, but we're also using building that new subway system to start getting the kinds of data we need to turn around and start increasing the productivity of our construction industry. But that's not how I think people are thinking about it right now. Uh, the other thing is technological uptake capacity. So as I mentioned, we talk a lot about uh, AI and the future of construction in Hong Kong. We have a fairly advanced framework and a fairly advanced industry, but construction industry growth is going to be massive in places that do not have the degree of kind of technological uh, sophistication that we have here in Hong Kong. So one of the things that Vishnu found during all this qualitative work is that many, many of the firms just don't have the ability to really be great users of this technology. Um, they're gonna have to kind of use off the shelf stuff. And a lot of the contractors in that system are not in a position without some sort of help to be adopters, right? And I think that's important. So one thing we haven't thought about is what is the government role in these sorts of industries to upgrade capacity for uptake of innovations, right? It's not just, hey, can we get it out there? But how do we get it to the firms that would benefit the most, right? So some of it's about capacity, some of it's about the kind of capital outlays you need, some of it's about how you set up contracting to kind of or encourage that kind of use in your contracts, right? Because if it's going to cost them money and increase the price, they're not going to win the tender. So, you know, I have, I just flash this up. This is an innovation systems model I use. And I said, you know, from this construction idea, we can see a few places already where government can have facilitating roles. One is in what I call increasing the knowledge stock. It's, it's how do we use the government to help facilitate data collection? Maybe it's through platforms. Maybe it's using its power as both a tenderer and a, and a kind of actual construction um, entity. Another is this initial adoption question, right? Can you use your role as a government buyer of services to put into that system opportunities or requirements for particular technologies to be integrated or particular you know, approaches to be used, right? Governments can decide how they want to do it. Obviously, there's always rules about this, but it is something that you could consider. 
And another thing is about this widespread use. How do we how do we roll these things out so they become much more widespread and have that productivity dividend? And I would say this is where, you know, you could look to our friends in agricultural innovation where we have very nice models of uh, you know training, upgrading uh, ways to help train farmers. The Green Revolution started this, and we still have very effective agricultural outreach. And I know from my other research that that has been expanded often into more advanced manufacturing contexts. So we have models out there, but we're perhaps not thinking about it yet quite enough in those terms. So one of the things I think that I saw in this work was that more data and support for more data is not always sufficient for a full technology push kind of approach, right? It's not enough just to make the data on the platform show up. We have to think about how we expand that. And then the second side is this innovation for policymakers, right? Um, that I shouldn't be there. Government can be an actor throughout the value chain, as I said, right? Governments collect data, they use data, they regulate the data, and they regulate the impacts of data-driven innovations in terms of environment, energy, social aspects, right? This was in Gleb's talk and across other, others as well with potential policy goal conflicts arising that have to be managed. But then the question also is that, you know, we also have to deal with which governments where and when. Okay, because government, once again, I have a few of my students in my room and I ban the use of the government does because we have lots of actors here. We have different agencies, we have different levels. Um, so how effective are governments as markets themselves? Because one of the things we see, of course, is the uptake of these systems in smart cities, but other, other uses as well as the actual kind of users. And I would say we have mixed results. Um, we saw some great e-government work in China, but e-government has a checkered uh, implementation history, right? Some places it's worked really well, some places not as well. Sometimes the promises have been slow to deliver. I think it's getting better. Everyone's been talking about electric health records, electronic health records for decade or more now as a way to get better health data, improve efficiency. And once again, we see a lot of expensive investment, but not always a whole lot of really good actual meeting of policy goals with this. Um, it's still it's still not quite there. Once again, in Hong Kong, we do have, uh, the health authority has this data center, but it's very challenging, right? Health data is, is something the governments with social health systems have a lot of, but of course it has to be protected very carefully. So using it is very challenging and brings up a lot of kind of ethical and regulatory issues. So that even though the government has a lot of capacity here to, to kind of pull the market in this direction, um, it's not, it, it's, it's proven to be somewhat challenging. And of course, AI assisted decision-making, there's must be a million academic papers about what can go wrong here. Um, and once again, because do we have the right data, the good data, and do we actually, you know, what do we need and what do we not need? Um, are we pulling essentially for the right technologies from a public uh, perspective? So I know I wanna kind of wrap up and leave time for others, but I think that in the case of data-driven innovation, I would say that these roles are very much intertwined, that the government as user, regulator, and facilitator, uh, it overlaps a lot. And so this perhaps is both opportunities, but challenges the discussions about what the policy should be, because those goals, right, of kind of, it's kind of, um, you know, Gleb was talking about his model about you know, stringency of regulation, consumer protection, but at the same time, you want to be creating spaces to develop your domestic, uh, domestic, you know, kind of data-driven innovation industries, but also to, you know, be providing particular products. These are always challenging, but I think that the entanglement is stronger here than in some other sectors I've looked at. Uh, the second thing is um, high impact versus feasibility. I think you know, there's a challenge between deciding you want to go for the obvious low hanging fruit and, and looking for you know, looking for your keys under the lamppost and thinking more creatively about what actually like that's kind of the, the things that are easily feasible might not be the things that we want to do. Um, and so how do we balance that kind of um, the challenge between things that might be very high impact with things that you know kind of get a lot of hype and investment right now. And so the government's job is a long-term facilitator of a long vision of innovation and not just the thing that's getting the most kind of coverage from the Financial Times this week is also is also a challenge. And, I, and once again, I, I'm not gonna go too much into things like blockchain and currencies and things, but I think we saw a little bit of that there. And then I think also the potential to use regulation as a, as a tool. I didn't talk about this too much, but 
have room for these spaces, regulatory tools can be very important because they give guidelines and guardrails and even playing spaces, right? And this, this current highly decentralized bottom up with some stringent top down makes it very challenging for innovators to develop products. Um, and it makes it very challenging for governments to pick up those products. And so I think that if we see regulation uh, instinctively as something that is getting in the way, we're perhaps missing the opportunity to use regulation as a way to set important pathways and standards, right? And not just, I mean, some of those are technological standards around things like interoperability and data, you know, uh, data sharing and things like that. And some of them are around ethical standards that we need to kind of keep an eye on, right? We talked about uh, already today about normalization. And I think that better regulatory kind of thinking and approaches will go a long way as well to help create clearer spaces for those facilitation activities and for the innovation to happen. So that is the end of my... Thank you uh, very much. I think you raised many um, important questions when we talk about uh, regulation and also at the same time facilitating innovation, at the same time addressing concerns, privacy and security issues. And so we will discuss this after all the presentation. Okay, and then I'd like to invite Professor um, Yun Suk Hwan. Um, he's a professor of technology management, economics and policy program at the Seoul National University in South Korea. He's a really a leading expert on, on data data innovation, particularly smart cities. So I'm very pleased to have him here today. So Professor Huang, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yaremi, and for your invitation and friendship, and also your devotion to create the also ASEAN community to be actively participating and creating new community for data for policy. And also I really thank uh, also uh, Dr. Janep Nzin, uh, you know, who uh, in the beginning actually have a very founding uh, uh, role to make this happen. I, uh, I've been actually in um, data for policy in, you know, three years ago, 2019 with the, uh, Professor Arimi. And I realized that this frontierism community is actually very needed. And also I think that pioneering effort has been going on. Uh, since then, actually I come back to Korea. I've been actually built, tried to build the innovation system around our university, especially in the smart city. Uh, and also because innovation system is very important when we are talking about data you know, data sharing, and these are on in relation to that how those are institutionally and legally and democratized, and then also how that data to be equipped with intellectual capability by human, mm -hmm. so that uh, that 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 uh, the innovation system, the university's role and researchers role, and also even business and municipal role is very important. So. So for the last three years, uh, also uh, Anep, now Dr. Anep Unzin, and also all the, you know, my friend in data for policy, you know, I, and appreciate for your patience not, for not being able to contribute to the, the conference that much, but I actually tried to create the, some role model that how the data for policy or for policy for data can be practiced in Korea or worldwide. So today I'm gonna actually give you you know, for my last three years of work that where I created innovation system, you know, based in Seoul National University and with the Smart City National Project, where we'll build and how the data is used. So I'll try to give you the real case, how did this do, you know, and along with the, 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 the our key discussion, what we have, I'll continue that uh, issue, innovation for policy and policy for innovation, that, you know, both sides of the, the, you know, dynamics are needed, I'm gonna actually outreach that into the theme of smart city, you know, where we need the data for policy at the same time, policy for data. And then how we approach that, I'll share with you, you know, what we are doing now. So I have a presentation uh, which I'm using these days. Um, and so let me, this one. Okay, can, can you see the slide, everyone? 
Yes, yes. Okay, so, yeah. So, because my time is only 10 minutes, I'll make it quick. And so, anyway, uh, uh, I try to outreach the, you know, smart city with the data for policy or these data driven innovation as a kind of global civilization effort. Because data is only language we can communicate, you know, together. Uh, you know, not tied to the net, you know, natural languages, but we believe these intelligence capability we have is actually allow us. And we as SNU have been actually creating uh, the, uh, digital transformation expert over last 20 years, and then having uh, more than 80 country and national leader and expert the data transformation expert, you know, who are the leader, you know, who can represent data also are there. And based on that human network, like we have in data for policy, um, we I beg to envision and persuade our government, our university to create an innovation system as a smart city. The reason I see is university has a very good important role to solve the problem, which I will say great transformation it is needed. I'm not gonna talk that much, about which we all agree how to change and we are looking for. But at the same time, I see the university's role is very important this will play as a city, university, as Agora and platform, and, and also police, you know, within the city where the intelligence and new you know, practice has been going on, you know, based on the diversity and based on the also, you know, new innovative, actually in the thinking and also leadership. So uh, I realized that the campus we have, or, you know, Hong Kong, also Science Technology University and also UCL you know, Cambridge and Harvard and everywhere. If the role of university is very important for the civilization, especially in the smart city civilization, which is a model for the data-driven innovation. So uh, you know, I uh, realized then that our role of the city and also you know, and relationship with the university should be different. And then I say that I changed the S to C and then university. So in Korea, uh, I'm kind of like a preacher, you know, talking that we have to create, save, we have to save, right? And then is actually, you know, we have uh, some, you know, uh, the smart city district, we're based on the campus where we will do startup and other kind of pioneering job. And then solving the singularity problem of humankind. And then finally our solution, it can be applied for the universal city and also city in the universe, like in the moon. The sustainability issue that we're dealing with should be able to solve the problem that how we can civilize the, the space in the moon. So I actually, you know, we actually are now creating that kind of new campus and, and then are collecting our researchers and schools and professors within one organization under SNU or with SNU and creating. Now they like a global open innovation network and group project, you know, and also you know, kind of coordinating with the international organizations such as World Bank. Uh, we have the, the picture what you see is our new campus, where I have also whole eighth floor as an innovation center of the with where we studied new smart city education. So this new open innovation with the smart campus development is necessary and needed. And then I've been doing that for last three years. And thank uh, and thanks for the understanding, my friend, in the data for policy, my absence in the community. But anyway, that you know, some of the you know smart cities objects are very common for everyone. But here you see on the bottom two, global and university, that you may not see in any you know like city-driven innovation system or city-driven in a smart city project. But I actually create this flagship that that in a global and university as a kind of very important innovation system where we can nurture data driven economy and also digital economy in the world. And for that reason that I, I, I actually will explain more. For the last three years, actually in 2020, when I come back after you know, and we created new department called the Smart City Global Convergence and well-funded and then more than 7 million uh, you know, scholarship and you know, capacity building project, where, which allows us actually to create also capacity building, not only for Korea and worldwide. And recently also we received ASEAN also Smart City 
uh, ASEAN Smart City Network is uh, 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 sponsored, and with also ASEAN Korean Cooperation Fund, also which actually support more than six million of uh, also capacity building for the ASEAN, uh, you know, professional. I believe, uh, you know, when we have a data, uh, we should have a good professional, the, the people and leadership who do have to create the innovation system with a good trust with the, their neighbor and with the people and within the innovation system. So first thing in the, in the, in the data driven innovation, we need to educate uh, our leader or frontier and, and also researcher. And then in that regard, Hong Kong, you know, also University of you know, Science Technology and also Singapore uh, National University and also UCL and, you know, Oxford, all these universities were who they preach it that the importance of smart city, very important. So in that regard that uh, we created new campus and with a new institution with, uh, you know, more than eight department head and then, then, then you know, certain faculty member who are in, you know, and that, but we have a partner also faculty worldwide, like a professor Yarimi, and then we are building. We institutionalized uh, for that with uh, many also municipality and also global partners such as World Bank and GCF, and also CityNet, and also WeGo, World you know, Smart City Organization, and also Global Institute, and also US government, and also Neo City Project in Osceola County in Florida, and also Neom City in also in Saudi Arabia, and also New Capital Smart City Development, along with a business partnership with Korean government and also Indonesian government. So the, the reason is, you know, along with that development, a lot of data will be actually produced, and those data need to be also made to be useful, you know, for any kind of decision or planning, at the same time, make the, uh, the best quality of life for the people. Well, I think as a, so, in order for us to create a you know, good ecosystem for the data-driven innovation, important thing is still the resource and projection. So you cannot build a, such kind of capacity without the money. So in any way, not only as a scholarship from the Ministry of Education, but as a probably in you know, R&D project, any kind of bond, but which will be connecting research with the education. You know, we all realize the engineering education or even policy education need to be multidisciplinary. At the same time, these cannot be dividable between research and education. So in that regard, that to create a very creative research or leader for the future society, we need to create a, some kind of project where our new leaders should be also trained at the same time doing the project and solve the problem of the society where the data actually can be flowing well. So we, we are in the, the construction that to create such kind of uh, also constructive innovation system that where we will. So we are in the second phase of building this one, already educational part are done. Um, this color part is actually the one what you see on the top is also world, mark, world uh, uh, landmark tower, which we say world, uh, world Bank Global Campus, and also which will host a lot of innovation, also institution, data-driven innovation. And on the right side, R&D Hub, which will be also data-driven innovation. And Kakao Data Center will be also have their data, largest data center, say in Korea, uh, will be within our campus, which will be in the top of the whole. And so we have a good data-driven innovation system ecosystem. At the same time, in the bottom line, you see the hospital, university hospital, which will be you know, promoted as a smart medicine. You know, currently the regulation does not allow us to have a telemedicine, but actually this will be, you know, world new, also global, you know, university hospital where we will practice global medicine with a telemedicine. So one of the reason is uh, the data sharing is not going, you know, too much other than the academia. So we try to realize open data policy by creating new community. And then where the, you know, everyone actually as a leader and practice their ownership of the data to be shared with others. So these global open innovation center, you know, which will be hosted in World Bank campus is will be realized in next five to seven years. So we believe that, you know, and these are the projection we see. So, but out here, you know, uh, that I will uh, introduce new innovation system uh, theory, what I call generative innovation system. It, which is named with the GNR, Global Innovation System, National Innovation System, and Regional Innovation, integrated. 
So that, uh, you know, these are, you know, all intertwined with the data economy and data de 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 driven innovation, where we can host uh, all the citizenship and data, you know, also uh, citizenship prosperity, you know, by having them to be engaged in the global society at the same time, having much more freedom to be a citizen in both or multiple cities, like being in Hong Kong, China, and being in Chihun in Korea, such as. So uh, these are currently in practice. Uh, we university are working not only with the municipality and our government and Minister of Foreign Affairs, where they actually create can create a legal fund where Korean can have a dual citizenship. And then at the same time others. And these are you know, be possible because we our campus in free economic zone. So which are considered to be not only the national boundary in global society, you know, based on the business country. So in that way, I see that the community we are having, which data for the, you know, policy has been actually bloomed, you know, by the good leadership of UK. And then citizenship has been you know, prospered, you know, through the data for policy and good leader has been actually recognized. And I think we university are doing that to unify, you know, our community and saving for the future. So I believe, I, I think that I'm gonna, but how this can be interwined and connected with the city and also data? Well, I think data democracy development, I will say, okay? Why? Data is datum and datum is the fact. Data is the fact. And this fact from the imaginary fact or you know, people's fact or what in the reality or should be stored, it should not be different. And we are facing the fact in fact and data, de you know, democracy development is that where you start to how to create the innovation system. You know. The beginning, I believe either it would, could be data center, but not only data center, city lab. So, you know, city lab is kind of laboratory level of, you know, data collection. You know, it's a different concept from the living lab and that uh, where you can actually have created uh, this kind of nucleus, you know, to bloom that as a innovation ecosystem for the data driven. And uh, already we successfully finished, and I am also, you know, deeply involved in the leadership of this city lab, which is my floor of our education. This is actually a floor of our, our Siung Smart City campus, and that is going to be turned to the, let's say, innovation center. So Korea uh, actually made a law on Smart City already three, of, uh, three years ago, more than three years ago, and that, you know, how the, National Innovation Center can be authorized and officialized. So we plan to actually create this one seed lab to transform the innovation center. We officially engage all the data as a public and private partnership places. And we have also the budget that support and legal foundation. This should be recommended by the city municipality, the mayor and the Ministry of Land and Info, you know, Transportation and Infrastructure should authorize based on that recommendation after some examination. Finally, I believe that such kind of innovation center will play very important role and in the smart city as a innovation district. So I think that will be the kind of then, then the project development and data driven development, I believe which is important. Finally, also these developments are not national or regional only, should be global, as you can see. So the, we actually started our educational program as a global convergence and our all, uh, the teaching and majors are also, you know, are also using all the smart city portfolio, all the world, not only Korean nation. So in Korea, in fact, as of 2023, more than 80 city smart city official project is going on. So I have access to all 80 smart city portfolio and action plan and actual business model out of it, but which is not enough. So we are collecting collaboration with the many universities in the world. And also I'm inviting all my, you know, data for policy play in a friend that were being partnership with us and then sharing such portfolio, how the data can be good for policy, how we can create the policy good for data and for the data democracy. This is a kind of, you know, snapshot picture about our ecosystem in also in our university at the same time, Xiong Smart City. I'm not gonna actually move on too much, but I say data democracy. So I think the citizenship prosperity should be the result of the smart city. And at the same time, and we see that data play very important role for our good democracy. So 
in that regard, how to keep up these one. And then I declared that, you know, smart city, you know, generates a 3.0. Well, like looking smart city, not only as a platform, but the platform that provides service, right? And then, then for everyone, then I will say, then this dimension actually should incorporate both in the digital twin and the metaverse, where that could be a medium for the, you know, how the data can be interpreted and stored and also create a new data over, you know, and overcoming any kind of limitation of our physical uh, spaces, but also creating and integrating the spaces of our social uh, humanity. And that is a, uh, so, so far the data, you know, the digital <laughs> grid is <laughs> used. And, um, okay, yeah. So, up, all, uh, uh, and then, so this is all of my, I can talk about this 3.0 more, but I think metaverse will and digital will be very important, not in the planning stage, but in the data driven also innovation. So I'll be happy to share more in discussion, but I, and, uh, but I think today's discussion would be very you know, pro also constructive you know, for our future collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for one. And this is such an innovative and uh, exciting initiative in South Korea. And uh, there are a lot of issues you raise uh, with regard to how to facilitate the uh, university as a kind of platform for collaboration and innovation. Thank you very much. And then I'd like to invite uh, Professor Sabrina Luk from Nanyang Technological University. Um, she's also working uh, extensively on those data, particularly for health issues. So I'd like to invite her to give her talk. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. So thanks for inviting me to give a presentation on Singapore's use of data and technology in the time of COVID-19. Uh, Singapore is a smart nation which uses different types of technology to achieve economic growth and better serve citizens' needs. In today's presentation, I'll talk about um, how the Singapore government utilizes technologies to facilitate the nationwide mass distribution uh, exercises. Could you make it as a presentation? Mode. Uh, so in, oh, sorry. Um, can you see it now? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. So um, in Singapore, wearing face masks uh, is a public measure to prevent uh, the spread of the virus that causes COVID-19. Starting from uh, 14 April 2020, wearing face masks become compulsory in Singapore. So in the first, uh, in the first nationwide uh, mass distribution exercise, a total of 1,500 Singapore Armed Force uh, servicemen were mobilized to pack 5.2 million uh, face masks to be delivered to 1.3 million households in Singapore. So large vans and military vehicles were used by the SAF servicemen to deliver the masks to 89 community centers, CC and resident community uh, RC centers to be uh, collected by the public. So a website, a website called Mask Aware was built and designed by a team of developers at the Government Technology Agency of Singapore, GovTech for short, in less than 12 hours to allow users to key in their postal code to learn about their respective mass collection points in a timely and accurate manner. Cyber security specialists at GovTech uh, carry out penetration testing to ensure that the website would be secure when it went live. So the second um, nationwide mass distribution exercise, which took place in early April 2020, was uh, similar to the first one. So Singapore residents uh, headed to CCs and RCs to collect a free reusable uh, mask. But uh, when it came to the front round of uh, the nationwide mass distribution exercise uh, is a bit uh, different. So for this round of um, mass distribution exercise, the government distributed uh, 6 million uh, reusable cough masks to all Singapore residents through CCs, uh, RCs, and 400 uh, to, uh, 24 hour vending machines. So each vending machine uh, had an attached guide uh, in four different languages detailing uh, three steps for collection the mask. So staff were also stationed at the vending machines to help members of the public. So the uh, three steps were very simple. So the first step was the press of 
an on-screen button to enter the number of the product uh, column. The second step uh, was a quick scan of one's uh, identity card. So the final step was the collection of a uh, face mask. So the entire process uh, took less than 15 seconds. So there was the implementation of uh, temperature ticking as well as cleaning and restocking of uh, uh, restocking face masks um, at vending machines regularly. So all high touch areas on the vending machines were also uh, tested, uh, treated with uh, self uh, disinfecting coating, which could last for three months. CCTV, uh, CCTV cameras were connected to uh, all the vending machines to help uh, catch those uh, who may damage the vending machine and those who may use um, illegally obtained personal information to collect a face mask. So similar to the previous round of uh, mass distribution exercise, so Singapore residents could visit uh, the Mass Go Wear website to get more information or to check the availability of uh, masks in the vending machine. Uh, so Mass Go Wear uh, had over 5.5 million uh, visits over three rounds of uh, nationwide mass distribution. So for the third round of um, uh, for the third round of uh, mass distribution exercise, it was also supported by uh, Redeem SG, so which was a mobile application and system developed by um, Open Government Products, uh, a division under GovTech. So the mobile application allowed the staff to scan residents' uh, identity card when they come to CCs and RC to collect a face mask and uh, record which person had collected the mask. And the Redeem SG system was also in integrated to, uh, into vending machines to track the redemption of, uh, of masks. So the good things about uh, using vending machines to distribute face masks are that is uh, very convenient. So compared to um, the manual uh, collection when a resident could only go to CCs and RC to collect face masks uh, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., the vending machine is a uh, is a twenty four hour one. So basically, uh, so citizens so, so they can uh, go down to collect the face mask uh, anytime. So and then another good thing about uh, using vending machine is that uh, it helps save manpower. So for this round of a uh, mass uh, distribution exercise, only one hundred and fifty SAF servicemen and about forty military vehicles were involved in transporting the mask to community centers across the country. So the Redeem SG system help uh, track the record of face mask uh, distribution easily and efficiently. So actually, it can uh, reduce the uh, human era. Okay, uh, era when when uh, previously I think they they just uh, use a paperwork, right? So so this is more efficient. So because of uh, the benefits brought by the 24-hour vending machine, we can see that uh, in Singapore, the vent the use of vending machines has been uh, 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 used in the subsequent rounds of nationwide mass distribution exercise. Uh, besides, their use were also extended uh, to allow residents to replace uh, trace together token, which are not working or running out of battery. So uh, what is a trace together token? So actually it, it is the digital connect tracing devices, uh, a device uh, developed in um, uh, Singapore. So a uh, vending machine can uh, is also used uh, by uh, the government, okay, uh, starting from September uh, last year, to allow residents who receive a uh, health risk warning or a health risk uh, alerts through SMS notification from Ministry of Health to collect their antigen rapid kit, uh, rapid test kit. Uh, so I think uh, so. So through this um, uh, case study, so the uh, what we can see is that so if um, technology they are used uh, properly. So they are supposed to bring a uh, benefits to citizens, uh, government officials, and relevant uh, stakeholders. So in in this case, uh, we can uh, we can see that when technologies and humans are combined in a suitable manner, uh, together they are able to perform on a um, just a much higher level on a much higher level. Um, so technology should, uh, so in this case we can also see that uh, technology uh, can complement human labor instead of uh, replacing it. And at the same time, uh, it can free up our human beings to focus on works uh, that are more engaging and valuable. And um, of course, uh, through this case study, we can uh, see that the government uh, 
carry, uh, use technology right to to carry out this nationwide mass distribution exercise um and and they also um, make use okay of uh just like website to help citizens to get better uh decision okay uh, informed decision because at that time we try to avoid cloud okay avoid cloud avoid uh, waiting for uh, just like a, a long time to get the face mask so that's why uh, with a website that can provide data in a, in an efficient and regular uh, manner it actually reduce humans exposure to the virus yeah so that's why I think uh, because Singapore uh, has been a uh, is a really strive to build a digitally inclusive society. And then here we can see that uh, this is a very good example to see how the government use different types of technology to enable citizens to enjoy the, uh, the, the benefit of our technology. So I think uh, from this case, we can see the principles of inclusiveness, the principles of uh, empowerment are being up, uh, upheld in this, uh, in this case. Uh, so uh, that's the end of my uh, presentation. So uh, if you're interested in uh, knowing about more uh, the government, uh, Singapore government's uh, effort to combat, uh, to combat uh, COVID-19 and how uh, Singapore built its uh, smart nation. So please, uh, you're welcome to read uh, my uh, recent publication called uh, Singapore After Lee Kuan Yew. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. And um, this is a very interesting example in the case of Singapore. And uh, yeah, there are many implications, as I mentioned, uh, based upon this uh, the particular case, in, in particularly in the time of the uh, crisis. Um, okay, um, we have um, um, a, a relatively limited amount of time for discussion, but uh, perhaps um, I'd like to start by asking a question with regard to capacity. I think uh, Kira mentioned the capacity is an important issue, and also Professor Huang mentioned the educational initiative using uh, university as a kind of platform for collaboration with uh, many stakeholders. But then again, what kind of capacities, skills uh, would be important in facilitating such a kind of initiative? So I'd like to ask this question to probably all of you. So maybe Pascal can start. I think, I mean, I think there's several, several different aspects of this capacity. Right? As universities, we're of course always thinking about, you know, educating people who are going to go out and, and do these things and use these things. But, you know, if, if we think about government as user, even the Singaporean government has very high uh, administrative capacity. Uh, you know, they're known for this and they, they train very well. Not every government has the same capacity to do technology uptake. And in fact, there was a survey done in, of Australia and Hong Kongers, um, comfort with the use of AI by government. And the Hong Kongers big takeaway of the survey last year was, was basically that it's not that they don't trust, I mean, there's trust issues in Hong Kong government, but a lot of the, the issue is they didn't think the government actually had the capacity to use these technologies. Um, and so I think that in terms of, you know, there's both the capacity, there's like a user capacity problem here. And the problem with, with user capacity issues is that if the government is one of those users, for example, and they don't have a lot of kind of lots of deep internal capacity, how do they choose things? How do they know how to use the data, et cetera? So you know, getting getting people in there who, who have the technological chops is actually a really big challenge, especially at more local level. So I think a lot of work on, you know, um, I don't call it civil service training, but but actually thinking very carefully about what what government capacity is broadly in all the different places that these technologies and these data collection uh, elements are coming from in a lot of places is really important, as well as kind of you know, users in the field. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Huang. Okay, well, um, well, in terms of capacity. Well, I've been thinking not only, you know, for all citizens and, uh, you know, data for in a data-driven innovation. But first of all, um, you know, when we say data-driven, and it seems like, you know, we are connecting a uh, different intelligence. So collective intelligence or diverticism is very important, you know, in, during the, you know, capacity building that, you know, then multidisciplinary education or training, right? So when we are, you know, training semiconductor, let's say engineer, they should be kept not only for the engineering that right and but you know you know additional level of collective you know intelligence they should work on the the reality is that when we are building innovation system we there will be a lot of you know pu uh, public and private partnership 
where you will be challenged by different languages and different leadership and different culture. So collectivism very important, uh, collective intelligence very important to be dealt with. The capacity should deal with that one. Second one is also, you know, you need to create a new community. You know, when data driven, create a different landscape and different governance structure, at the same time, they will create different community. Really. So totally that may challenge the existing governance and then the leadership should be based on that, how would the leader who will be the frontier and communitizing. So in, the, in terms of engineering, in terms of you know, architect and other things. Constructive innovation should also should be so that not only in you know, a kind of idea practice and pioneerism that requires a lot of you know, strong devotion on it. And in, you know, I want to say also citizenship. You know, when you know this is more so you know, in the smart city, but data is the fact and data is for good for people and policies for the you know, public welfare. And finally, quality of life is in you know, virtue and then citizenship prosperity, inclusivism, and then you know also that is should be inherited, and where you know also many new leaders actually should we keep with that one. Finally, you know, our assumption about the human capability should be by using AI or you know, we are creative humanism. So smartest or smartism actually should be done that for that, that our generation and their people and assumption what we have is everyone smart. And how you we create that smartism and then using AI and other, you know, and autonomous capability. So these five areas is actually in a core theme of my, uh, you know, also capacity building when we do expert training and also leadership. This should be both in engineering, but in the policy and economies and business purpose. So I want to say that, you know, very important thing is currently we are in the very beginning stage of data driven, but we need a good leadership and more than that to be done. Okay. That's it, Professor Eremi. Thank you very much. Um, then I'd like to invite uh, Professor Luke. Um, the Singapore is very concerned to be uh, quite uh, having a quite high capacity, particularly on, on the public sector, for example. But then that uh, to make this data driven innovation systems work, you also need to have capacity on the side of users and also other stakeholders. So how are Singapore um, uh, approaches trying to address uh, this challenge? Uh, so in Singapore, uh, in general, I mean, uh, people are rather tech savvy. Yeah. So I think because uh, they are not, uh, they are no strangers to technology. But yet, I mean, I mean, Singapore uh, still has digital divide. But I think if I just use the case of uh, the nationwide dis uh, mass distribution exercise, what I can tell you is that I think uh, during the process of uh, outbreak communication, when the government tried to uh, tell people that now I, I try to let you uh, use okay vending machines okay and different types of technology right, to collect face masks or know about the uh, updated information about uh, the availability of masks right so I think they make use of different channels okay the traditional uh, channel like a uh, uh, TV right national uh, just like TV okay radio broadcast and plus the new uh, new mass media right like uh, uh, gaff.sg and then so YouTube right, something like that I think uh, Facebook so different platform to to uh, to, to deliver knowledge right to citizens. So that's, this is one way to build capacity. And I think the government uh, keep repeating, okay, that uh, you, you, this is an optional, this is an alternative channel for you to obtain face masks. So, 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 so I think that's, that's, that is how, okay, because if we use, uh, using the concept of free aid, right, the uh, 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 awareness, like right, acceptance, and then uh, something like, so, 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 so it's about awareness, right? Sometimes you, you tell people, okay, uh, about, the technology when right? people are aware of it, but they, they may not accept it. So I think here in Singapore is uh, some of them, uh, some of the people they they was uh, because I think in the case of uh, the face mask distribution, you're asking uh, people to scan their identity card. So this is a kind of personal information, right? rather sensitive. So, so I think there's still some people that rather uh, stick with the uh, official, uh, the traditional channel by collecting the face mask. Uh, in person, right? So, but I think uh, on the other hand, the, the government uh, make use of uh, different channels to communicate with the public. That so, I'll try to ensure that uh, this is okay, safe. Okay, this is uh, secure. So you can see the CCTV. Okay, there's also a uh, uh, staff right standing. Okay, uh, next to the vending machine, and they will try to uh, 
deliver brochure okay to to citizens so i think this is how uh once you uh people's uh, inner fear okay they, they overcome the inner fear okay they will become more acceptable uh to technology yeah and I think for this round of uh, the nationwide phase uh, distribution, uh, mass distribution exercise, we are not talking about using artificial intelligence or something like that, really high tech. But I think vending machine or website or SMS notification is something that uh, people are rather familiar with right, in their daily life. So this is something not very odd okay, to them. So that's why this is more uh, acceptable. Yeah, more acceptable. Yeah, so this is why, yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, well, um, I'd like to invite uh, the audience to ask a question, but I'm sorry, uh, the time is already up. Um, so um, I'd like to close this session, but uh, there are many issues um, you mentioned, um, the, the speakers mentioned with regard to uh, utilizing these emerging technologies, um, but then we also need to think about all the capacities on the public sector and also citizens and other stakeholders, so how to create kind of arena where uh, we can facilitate collaboration and then make innovation and then also governing the innovation. So thank you very much for the speakers um, for their excellent talks and uh, the discussions. Thank you very much.